again and welcome. In this tutorial, you will learn how to craft articulating leather gauntlets. This style is part of the Imperial Knight series, which is our second complete armor together. Feel free to follow along for the leather crafting tips and ideas, or head over to the Prince Armory Academy and pick up the pattern and build these yourself, and stick around to the end for some great bonus tips. To start the crafting process, we need to cut out the pieces for the project. If you are cutting the pieces by hand, you will start by tracing out all of the pieces onto the leather first. The Imperial Knight series has a lot of really intricate geometry to cut, so I have a bonus video in the works that will show you how to easily cut this all by hand. If this is something you want to see, you know what to do. This Imperial Knight series was created in part to introduce laser cutting for building and augmenting your armor and leather projects and it's hard to imagine a better case for using a laser than cutting the dozens of small, intricate, and repetitive parts that are in a complex pair of gauntlets. Most patterns in this series are already optimized for the Glowforge, which is what I'll be demonstrating here. If you own a different style of laser cutter, your steps may vary slightly. I'm using thick, natural, proof-grade leather from Glowforge for most of this project. The thickness is about 6 ounces, or 2.5 millimeters. That is a little too thin for many other armor projects, but for these more intricate gauntlets and other small bits like scales and buckle straps, it's actually really great. If you are using a Glowforge, your first step will be to load the leather into the bed of the machine. Add a little masking tape to the corners and edges if it needs any help laying flat. Once I load the leather into the machine, the built-in camera will scan the QR code and automatically fill in all the settings for you. To prepare the files, in your Glowforge app you will click Create, Upload from File, then select the first SVG file provided. Drag the layout to fit the bed of the laser. Set the layers for the holes and the outlines to cut, and the decorative trim layer to score, or set it to ignore if you do not want the borderline. And make sure the layers for the holes are above the cut layer. Then press the Start button and let it do its thing. Repeat this again for the opposite hand. And just a reminder, if you decide to add a Glowforge to your own workspace, use my affiliate code Prince Armory to save up to $500 on your purchase. Then you'll cut out the finger bits in the same way. For the loops and strap bits, I suggest using a thinner layer, around 4 to 5 ounces. If you are not using materials supplied by Glowforge, you have to input the settings manually. This was covered in some of the previous tutorials in this series.
leather from Glowforge came with a protective masking tape to prevent edge charring, which you can remove now. It's an extra step, but it can be pretty satisfying. At this stage, you can decide if you would like to decorate the piece with tooling or not. I did want to demonstrate another tooling technique on these gauntlets, but the Elven Lord series up next will have a ton of tooling, so I'll hold off until then. Be sure to subscribe if you don't want to miss those tutorials. And in the meanwhile, take a look at some of the previous tutorials which reveal many tooling techniques and tips. The next step for these gauntlets is to decide on the color. Previously it has been mentioned by some that I am messy while applying the dye and finish. But what if I told you there's another method where you can dye all of these parts without spilling a drop of dye, and you don't even need to wear gloves? In a previous video I revealed these planter trays which have a built-in drain rack. These are a bit crusty after many years of use, but they serve their purpose. The new tip for this video is to use a pair of needle nose pliers to quickly dip each piece in a container with dye. I'm using blue dye here and submerge each piece briefly and set it on the rack to dry. This is great when you have a lot of small parts to go through. Just to be gentle with how you grab the piece to avoid marking the leather, or try to grab the piece in an area that will be overlapped with another piece later. There is an even faster method, but it's messier so I'll have to save that for another time. And you're always free to choose whether or not to use these tips. But keep in mind that I try to show many methods and options for dyeing and any other crafting steps throughout these tutorials. I'm also trying to demonstrate the easy way for many techniques so that the projects are more approachable. I would like to see people dive in and get their hands dirty with a new craft. I think too many people get hung up on messing up or doing things the proper way. I say just get started and worry about optimizing later. To seal the leather, I'm simply dipping the pieces in Weaver's Tough Coat leather finish. And since I'll be painting the pieces, I'm not worried about the imperfections in the finish either. Check out some of the previous tutorials if you want to learn some options for finishing the leather. Before we move on to the next color step, I want to go ahead and assemble the knuckle plate while the piece is still damp and pliable from the dye and the finish. You can also perform this step before applying the color if you wish, but avoid assembling the piece while it's completely dry. You'll notice between each knuckle is a pair of rivet holes. You will need to fold the piece over on itself, finish side touching itself, and carefully set the smallest rivet you can fit. This forces a more three-dimensional shape for looks and structural support. Repeat this process for each knuckle taking care for each rivet. If you are using thicker leather, you may want to shave or skive along the edges to reduce the bulk slightly. To finish the look, you can work out the shape a little bit more to make it more pronounced. I've been looking for an opportunity to introduce airbrushing, so I decided to use these gauntlets for that purpose. There is way more to airbrushing than I can go over in this video, so the goal here is just to introduce you to the idea for now and we'll expand upon it in future tutorials. Createx sent over a bunch of color samples to use in this video and future airbrushing tutorials. I have used some of these in the past, but there's a lot of colors that are new to me in this batch that I'm excited to play with. As I've crafted this Imperial Knight series, I've demonstrated various options and as a result it's a little mismatched, so I might go back and paint it all later to match. If you'd like to see a video on that, you'll have to let me know. 
For now, I'll just be painting the gauntlets and I'm picking out a few of the blue colors that look nice and within the style of the suit theme. I'm dabbing a little bit of paint along the edge of a piece that will be covered later. To be more thorough, you could paint some test swatches. To start airbrushing, the first component you need is the air compressor. An Estiwata is one of the biggest names out in this space, and it's the one I've used the most over the years. To help with these tutorials, they've provided a few updates to my airbrushing setup. For this video, I'm using the Iwata PowerJet Plus compressor. And the second component you need is the airbrush itself, of course. Or in time, you may have several different airbrushes for various purposes. I'll be using the Iwata Eclipse HPCS airbrush for some of the future tutorials, but it's better for dye gradients and detail work. I could certainly airbrush all of the pieces with this airbrush, but it would take a while. When building armor suits, you really have to shift your thinking on how you do things because there's a lot of parts and a lot of space to cover. I will be painting the entire surface in this case, so I'll be using the Iwata Eclipse G5 airbrush, which will give me a quicker coverage of the pieces. The pearl paint and the G5 are both new to me, so I'm actively testing things out here. I want to do some more research and practice before I provide any real specific tips or guidance. But what I can tell you is that you can use an airbrush to apply dye, get nice gradients, paint with various unique colors, add shading and highlights, and a lot more. I also understand that painting over a natural material like leather is not to everyone's preference. It really depends on what you're going for and how it's going to be used. Leather's not the cheapest medium, and many will prefer a natural look. I suspect that some might even find painting leather blasphemous, but you'd have to be the judge for yourself based on the end result and your own preferences. There are cons and pros either way. With dye, it's not as prone to scratching, and it cannot chip or flake like paint. But there is a limit to the range of color and brightness you can get with tooling leather, especially when you consider that all vegetable tan leather will darken over time and with exposure to sunlight. So with paint, you can get more vibrant colors, but when you're painting something that's going to be worn and used, you have to expect some damage over time with the paint finish. Even dyed leather is not impervious to wear and scratches though. But this does not necessarily have to be a bad thing. A patina that comes with wear over time is often a sought after feature. I often intentionally add distressing and weathering to improve the overall looks, and also to make future wear and tear blend in naturally. Skipping forward a few minutes in the future when it's assembled, to give it a little depth and character, I'm going to give a very quick and rough texture with some black acrylic paint. Again, I'm just going for quick and easy here. I'm using a chip brush to get in the corners and along the edges, and I'm using a sponge to dab a little texture throughout the piece just to break it up a bit. I'll skip any additional sealing steps for now. I want to do some experiments using some of the sealers Createx provided, but that is outside of the scope of this video.
and now we finally come to the assembly. The first step I am taking here is to add the snaps while the pieces are still separate and manageable. When I create these designs, I do try to size the patterns to be a safe middle of the road size that will fit most people, but I always suggest before committing materials that you double check the fit and scale the design according to your needs. In this case, you want to make sure the gauntlets comfortably cover your hands and wrists. After that, if you need additional space in the cuffs, you can either extend the back cuff parts, add an extender plate, or substitute the snap blades for buckles. If you're going to wear an arming jacket, chain shirt, or arm armor, you will probably want to do one of those things. Now I am attaching the next layer that will make the sides of the cuffs. I'm using small double capped rivets. You can get these small black rivets that I'm using from Weaver. Then I'll start at the bottom for the center plates. Arrange the center plates from the smallest to the largest starting with the bottom plate. I'm seating all of the layers loosely here using medium rivets when going through three layers. Then I'll set all of the rivets consecutively. Repeat these steps for the other side and then you'll have your cuff finished. Next, I want to assemble the hand straps. It's a little tricky to describe the correct orientation, so please look carefully at how this is oriented on my left hand. Once you have it situated as shown, go ahead and set the ribbon. Then attach the hand strap to the knuckle plate. The orientation of the knuckle plate does matter. One way to tell which side is which is that the pinky side has a small barb that hangs down and it's wider on the side of the pointer and index finger. Now you need to arrange the wrist pieces. The base of the wrist is a rectangular piece, and the plates ascend in width from there. While I still have the pieces separate, I'm going to bend the edges up slightly to relax the leather. attaching the knuckle plate to the widest wrist lame. I'm using Chicago screws to do this. This is a different type of Chicago screw than you've seen me use before, but it's the same concept, and it allows you to have a sturdy point of articulation. Just don't forget
forget to glue them in place when you're happy with the end result. You'll connect the rest of the wrist lames using the Chicago screws. You will add the thumb tab and the thumb loop during this process too. You do have the option to customize the location for better fit. And in my case, I have the thumb tab on the third screw and the thumb loop on the fifth. And while you're at it, rivet the thumb piece to the thumb tab as shown. Notice the orientation. When you get all of the parts attached, give it a quick test fit. If you're going to wear this on bare skin, you may want to skive the inner edges a bit. And if any parts catch and don't articulate perfectly, you can trim just a hair off the edge too. I suggest you go ahead and lay out all of the finger parts and make sure to allocate all of the small plates. You need four plates for the pinky fingers, six plates for the middle finger, and five plates for everything else. In the patterns, I do provide some pre-sized finger loops, but I highly suggest you tweak the loop sizes to your own needs as it will vary a lot depending on whether you wear these with gloves or not and how big the gloves are and such. For assembling the fingers, if you have an anvil with a narrow horn, or if you can improvise with some other similar shape, that's great, but otherwise you can set the rivets flat from underneath. Don't forget to rivet in the small finger loop at the end of each fingertip, and a wider one under the last scale at the base of each finger. This project is one of the more complex pieces we've done, and if you're not careful, you'll end up setting some rivets incorrectly, or you'll forget a finger loop, for example. I designed these gauntlets and even I forgot. If this happens on a delicate piece like a finger scale, you don't want to damage the narrow bit of leather around the hole. My preferred method to extract an erroneous rivet is to grab something you can use as a center punch. 
then carefully punch a divot dead center of the rivet, then grab a drill with a bit around the size of the shaft of the rivet or a little larger. Take your time and drill into the rivet. My goal isn't to drill through the rivet, but to chip away at the metal until you can pry it away with some diagonal cutters. If you have a Dremel with a burr bit, this will also work. Thanks for coming along with this video. I've got some bonus tips for you in just a minute, but if you feel like you've learned something or enjoyed this video, or if you just think the project is cool, I hope you'll consider giving it a like. If you have any requests of what I should build next, let me know in the comments below. Some of the tools and materials in this video were provided by Weaver Leather Supply. If you would like to use some of the same hardware I used, like the rivets, some Chicago screws, various tools, dies, and more, head over to Weaver's online store, which is packed with everything you will need for your leather crafting projects. Thanks again to Weaver for their support in helping me bring these tutorials to you. Also, thank you to our patrons. I appreciate your continued support in this content. If you're not yet a patron and would like to help in the creation of future tutorials, you can get some great perks like monthly patterns, early access, and other great features. Head on over to Patreon and join us there. Or try out the new membership on YouTube. I'm recording more behind the scenes content, which will be going up soon. Alright, now I have some bad news. I know this is going to be enormously unsatisfying, but unfortunately, I don't have the final few minutes of footage for the assembly. I wish I was joking, but out of the three cameras I had recording, two of them hit their 30 minute recording limit, and the other one ran out of memory at the same time. What are the odds, right? So after that, I recorded a recap, and I'll cut over to that clip now. For the final assembly, I think it recorded up to the construction of the last couple of fingers. So that's all pretty straightforward. You would have just kept riveting the finger bits to the plate. Don't forget the finger loops. And then to attach them on the inside, I disconnected this top piece from here. So just to make it more accessible, you don't have to fight it. Um, just attach one finger at a time with the loop. You can see the rivet right in here. It's easy enough just to set it flat right in here. Go all the way down. One other point, I moved this one space back and I also noted that the in the in the next pattern update this will be a little bit larger to cover more space so I also wanted to point out that this design is something you can wear with or without gloves but if you size it to fit your gloves, um, you'll be able to wear it both ways. Whereas if you fit it, if you fit these loops to be snug with your fingers to begin with, it will be too tight with gloves generally. Um, and just for reference, these are a little bit short for me. I would size these up if I were making them for myself to be, you know, maybe 5% bigger, you know, just, just a little bit more. Um, but they're still pretty comfortable. There's pretty good wiggle room. 
regarding how they fit. So they're very comfortable, very flexible. And if it ever does get in the way, one of the things you can do is just pop these out over your fingers and then you have a little bit more dexterity here if you need it. And the other nice thing is you can swap out the gloves that you're wearing with this. Now these are supposed to be extra large. Uh, I don't believe them. Try to squeeze it in here. Very, very tight. So, but a snug glove is actually probably pretty good in this situation. I prefer a little bit longer myself, but. Fit through here. Right. And one of the things you'll notice is over time, this will break in a bit more and become softer, but straight out of the gate, it's still pretty, pretty flexible, pretty comfortable. It, again, it's a little bit snug on me. I would size this up, but there is some forgivability in the design itself. And you'll notice that there's extra space up in how this flares over the your wrist and forearm. That's so that your van brace or lower cannon can fit underneath it and it will rotate over it. You have this fit to where it rotates over your forearm. You can always add an extension here as well if you need to. Just add an in another maybe inch. But you can also scale this whole thing up. And then once you get it fit in there first, just grab at the wrist, hold the fingers, and then putting it on in the future should be a little bit easier. Bonus tip one. These patterns can be scaled to fit any size, so before beginning, you'll want to start by printing the patterns out on paper first and assemble a quick paper mock-up. When you're cutting out a paper mock-up, you don't have to be precise. You just need the rough outline so you can get a sense of the proportions. In subjective terms, I would call the default size at 100% scale large. If this ends up being too big for you, try nudging the scale down to around 90%. Bonus tip number two. If you're cutting by hand, the geometry of this style is very intricate and can be kind of tricky, but keep in mind you're not obligated to follow every line exactly. You might even like the design function of this piece, but you may not like all of the barbs and protrusions, so if you prefer, you can't ignore a lot of the geometry and just smooth out the lines. Bonus tip 3. This project may look complex, but honestly anybody can do it with basic tools and hardware. I do use a lot of tools that a beginner won't have, but I do also show many options and alternatives in this and other tutorials. If you watch the full series, you can make this and anything else with very basic tools. Bonus tip 4. 
A quick note about the glove selection. It doesn't really matter that much. I say it doesn't matter because you can literally wear whatever you want and adjust the loops to fit, but I suggest something pretty form-fitting and with not a lot of padding. The gauntlets are fairly versatile so you can swap gloves later or even wear them without gloves if you wish. The gloves featured in this video, I think I bought them on Amazon. I often grab various types of gloves to have on hand for various gauntlets. It's definitely possible to make your own gloves. Maybe we can make a future video on that. But it's a lot of extra work with sometimes not a lot of extra visual impact. So compared to something off the shelf, you just have to decide if it's worth the extra effort. Thanks again for joining us for this video. I really appreciate everybody who follows along and watches the videos and likes the videos and just gives us support in general. We've got a lot of really cool content just around the corner too, so I hope you'll subscribe and check that out too. Well, it's been fun and I hope to see you in the next one. Until next time, take care guys.